Now, the PGA Tour has revealed yet more changes with its designated events in 2024, but the question on everybody's lips, Andy, is have they just gone and copied Live Golf after <laughs> all of that chat? Are they just copying? Mm. Some quite incredible changes, Harry, um, have been made by the PGA Tour for, for next season and, and moving forwards. Uh, all I can say is that the rich are about to get richer, um, and that I think Live Golf is well and truly under the skin of the PJ Tour right now. I think that's probably fair to say. Um, the biggest changes they're making with these designated events next year. So there's going to be 10 of them. Um, and the, the big two things really are, and it's caused a bit of controversy in the industry this week, is removing a cut line uh, and limiting their fields, which a certain Live Golf has, has done. Um, is it a complete rip? I mean, no, not quite. Obviously, Live Golf has contracts, uh, teams, 54 holes instead of 72 holes. But the general idea behind this and, and keeping your big names happy uh, is a very similar idea. Um, now, I'm going to come on to my exact thoughts about all of this in a minute, Harry, but I just want to summarize to our listeners some of the significant changes that have been made to these designated events in 2024. Um as I touched upon, the first big one is the field sizes in these events will be reduced to between 70 and 78 players. That's roughly half of a normal field on the PJ Tour. So that's quite a considerable change uh, to start with. Um, the one thing to note is that changes will not apply to the majors. They won't apply to the Players' Championship and they won't apply to the FedEx Cup playoffs events, which I think is good news as they're the, you know, ultimately the biggest events of the year. Um, Another category, the top 50 players from this season's BMW Championship will all qualify for these designated events. Um, so effectively, those who play well during the season, they're going to be nicely rewarded, uh, especially when you think the first prize for these tournaments is just shy of $4 million, which again is very similar to Live Golf, where it is $4 million. Um, another category, all of the, the, the top 30 players in the world who are PJ Tour members, they'll all be in, so that keeps the big boys happy. Um, now, there will be opportunity for some of the lesser likes, those who are trying to break through this uh, next season. There'll be five spots available via non-designated tournaments. But all this means is that these guys are going to have to play very well in these handful of tournaments just to, to get into these designated events. Um, there'll also be 10 spots available for those players finishing high up on the FedEx Cup standings who are not otherwise exempt. And then finally, there will be four sponsor exemptions for PJ Tour members. And you can pretty much bet your bottom dollar that they've done this so that a certain Mr. Tiger Woods can get involved if he feels uh, fit and healthy enough to play. So quite a few categories. Um, let's pick holes in all of this. Um, first things first, and in answer to your question, Harry, yes, I, I think this is a very similar play to what Live Golf have done. As I say, it's not a complete rip, but it's very, very close. Um, no cuts is obviously the major talking point, uh, albeit you could argue, you know, there have been many PJ Tour events down the years without a cut um, in the World Golf Championships, for example, but we are now talking about 10 designated events. You know, this just isn't a handful of WGC events. So why have they removed so many cuts though? Great question. Um, it, it's, it's all down to money, right? I think yeah. removing cuts will attract more sponsors, make these events far more lucrative and appealing for them to, to splash the cash. Um, you know, it can often prove something of a headache when, you know, four sponsors, when your big names are missing the cut, uh, packing the bags on Friday night. It doesn't often happen, but but sometimes it can, right? Say Ram, McElroy, Scheffler, Spieth, Woods, they all have mares. Um you know, they're gone. They're gone Friday night and, and you're left with all due respect, players like Chris Kirk, Russell Henley, you know, with, as I say, with all due respect. But that isn't a draw for a sponsor on, on a weekend. If they've invested a lot of money and they're left with some of the lesser likes on the weekend, you know, there's more eyeballs on a golf tournament at the weekend as opposed to Thursday and Friday. Um, you know, you want your big names involved. So no cuts ensures everyone essentially is is there on the weekend it keeps everyone happy these players will also get paid you might have remembered from the netflix documentary harry that you know if you miss the cut you earn nothing so you're keeping players happy you're keeping sponsors happy um it gets so, rid of that jeopardy though doesn't it yeah absolutely yeah and, and you know what and 
I'm a big fan of Roy McIlroy, as you know, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable with with some of his comments that he made last week, essentially saying now how effectively important, you know, having no cuts is for the game and that they've been around for a while anyway. Um, it's like, well, hang on a second. Why did everyone hit out and live golf in the first place when they weren't using cuts? <laughs> it's just, mm. it doesn't quite add up to me. Um, I think Max Homer is probably the only player that's actually come out and, and said that he was the only one fighting to keep cuts. Um, you know, as a tour pro, it's always been that you have a cut mark, you know, you, you, you play your best for two rounds, you try and get through that cut mark and then push on over the weekend. So I think, you know, making this change in particular, uh, it somewhat tarnishes the PJ tour model, um, given its biggest and best tournaments won't have a cut anymore. Um, you know, it's a shame, you know, going back through the years, all the tournaments have had a cut. Um, but does anyone care about history these days? I'm not sure. I think it's now a sign of the times. Money's the most important thing, like it is in every other sport, I think. Um, and, and you know, I'll also add that, that many guys on the PJ Tour have, have used the whole no-cut argument as their main reasoning for why Live Golf shouldn't be involved in world ranking points, a uh, discussion that we've had on the podcast mm. uh, a number of weeks now. Um, but yeah, you know, these are 10 events on the PJ Tour where they're going to have no cut, but yet they're still going to be picking up world ranking points. And... I think that's quite a grey area now. I don't know about you, Harry, but that's, for me, it doesn't really add up now. You can't be for one and, and not for all kind of thing. With, with all of this, though, it, mm. it, does this spell good news for Live Golf or the fact that they're now, you know, kind of, they the, their mm. point of difference was all the things that the other wasn't doing. So now, mm-hmm. you know, are they, are, are they just going to go, oh, Mm. All right. Well, we need to we need to up the ante, or are yeah. we suddenly going to see more and more people come back to the PGA Tour if they're allowed to? And there's lots of drama yeah. around that. Absolutely, that's a great great question. I think I think Live Golf might feel a little bit aggrieved. You know, you've had players like Westwood and Paul to come out and kind of throwing the toys at the pram, going, "Oh, you know, what's all this about?" Um, but I mean, if, if if you're a big name PGA Tour player right now, why why would you go to Live Golf? It would be my would be you know, my first answer to that question, you've, you've got loads of money now. You can play in all the biggest events on the PJ Tour. You're still going to get your world ranking points to ensure that you're still going to be in the majors and, and, and everything else. All right, you won't have a chunky contract, but you've you got everything else. But then on the flip side, you could now argue that Live Golf has a great opportunity to maybe pick up some of the lesser likes on the PJ Tour because it's all good, you know, looking after the big name players on the PJ Tour. But what about some of the guys you know, lower down the, the pecking order. I mean, you only just need to go and read someone like James Hahn's comments. Um, you know, in recent days, he, he sounded like he's wanted to move to live golf for a while. But, um, you know, they like, like they've done, they've picked up players like Mito Pereira, um, Sebastian Minos, Thomas Peters. You know, they, they could probably look at and target a lot more of those sort of middle ground players um, who, who might be a little bit aggrieved about these changes for the PGA Tour. Because let's face it, it it, it's been done to make sure that PJ Tour keep hold of the top 30, 40 yeah. guys. So everyone else is lower than that. I think Liv Golf could target right now. And and just a quick one on the on the DP World Tour. Obviously, there's there's 10 cards available from the DP World Tour to go up to the PJ Tour next next season. But I think a lot of guys will now look at these changes um, and they might think, is there much point us stepping up and going on to the PJ Tour? Like we're going to have to play lights out in some of these non-designated events to even get into these tournaments. Is it going to be worth our time? Um, and maybe that's why someone like Thomas Peters did go two weeks ago. Maybe he caught wind of these changes and he just thought, you know what, I'm just going to jump shit and just, just kind of get out of here now. Um, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. Obviously we've got this court hearing still going on between DP world tour and live golf. We should know the results from that in probably before the end of the month. Um, but you have to feel these, you know, these latest changes. Maybe guys on the PJ Tour will be wishing that there might be some form of collaboration with Live Golf. You know, that's probably wow, a discussion for something. another day. But you know, I, I wouldn't surprise me if, if some of the guys are feeling a little bit like that. God, golf is a whole roller coaster ride at the moment, isn't it? Mm. It's just up yeah. and down, changing all the time. <laughs> My last question on this, though, yeah. I and mean, you brought it up a little earlier, mm. the idea of legacy. Is that now just irrelevant for players in these modern days? It's sad if that is the case. Um, you know, I think Jay Monaghan at PJ Tour has made a thing about legacy, um, you know, for PJ Tour. So again, you know, that's 
another reason, like I was saying, you know, removing a cut, it's like where you are taking away what's been there on the PJ Tour for years and years and years, you know, built up by Jack Nicholas, Arnold Palmer, where there was a cut. And now it's just kind of like, well, you know, you, you might be playing awfully the first two rounds. You would have necess- you would have gone home, you know, in previous mm. years, but you could end up shooting a 62, 63 on the weekend, charge through the tournament and end up winning it. And okay, if, like I say, it's all down to money now, keeping sponsors happy and, and the world is slightly different now, unfortunately. Um, and it, as I say, I think it does tarnish the PJ Tour products a little bit to to come away from a cut mark. And, you know, Eddie Pepperell, I think he made a great point last week, um, you know, saying, especially for him, he's missed the last four cuts. And he's like, for some of us, we want a cut because in a way it's like a, it's like a mini win. It, it, you almost feel like if you are struggling with your game, just making a cut first two rounds, it's like, oh, well, this is progress. Mm. Now that's gone now. Um, but I guess, you know, these designated events are just targeting the, the you know, the big name players. So they, they probably won't care too much about that. But um, yeah, it's a shame, I think, for, in terms of the legacy for PJ Tour, yeah. Yeah, well, we wait and see how it all pans out. Golf and controversy going hand in hand at the moment, mm-hmm. aren't they? And uh, even uh, as recently as uh, the weekend with, forget the action for a moment uh, before we get stuck into what actually happened at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Mm. Uh, a disqualification, controversial once again for one player in particular <laughs> during the second round, Andy. Talk us through what happened. Another incredible story. Yeah, PJ Tour player by the name of uh, Kamai Johnson. He qualified for this event through the, the APGA Tour. Um, he insisted that he made a six on the ninth hole, par four ninth, it was a tricky hole. Um, when he actually made a seven. Now, this is the sort of thing you would expect to hear on holiday with your mates after a couple of bevies, um, <laughs> but but not on the PGA Tour. Um, he had a par putt, I think, from 30 feet, and his group was put on the clock, so he was trying to speed up play. Uh, while he was putting out, his, his playing partners, Nick Hardy, Carl Westmoreland, they'd already skipped to the 10th tee just to try and, you know, try and get a move on. But from there, Johnson missed his par putt, missed his bogey putt, missed his double bogey putt, and tapped in for a seven. He got confused by everything, clearly. He, he insisted he made a six. So shot link, the on-course rules official, the walking scorer, all said it was seven. He's ended up signing for a, a wrong score, and ultimately he was he was disqualified. Um, he's since apologised on Twitter, saying he was just caught up in the moment. Uh, he lost count of how many putts he'd taken. He actually tweeted that. Um, and that he will do better next time. But I mean, come on, it's not as if he made a 20 out there, is it? It's not hard to count to seven. Mm. Um, he would have missed the cut anyway. So in the grand scheme of things, it, it, it didn't actually matter. Um, but, but, you know, golf is a game of um, integrity and you would expect a tour pro to not be making such a such a rookie mistake as, uh, as that. Netflix are going to be loving all of this, aren't they? You can imagine this is all going to make it into the second season if they get one. Um, but it wasn't all bad out there, though, at Bay Hill. There was some fantastic golf uh, played at the weekend, in particular from Kurt Kitayama, who uh, racked up a nice uh, $3.6 million in the bank with his maiden PGA Tour win after surviving what was a bit of a brutal break um, in the Arnold Palmer Invitational. What did you make of it, Wendy? Mm. Uh, incredibly exciting finish. Uh, I mean, about 10 players had a chance to win it with about an hour to play, it seemed. Um, so Kit Yama led by one going into the final round. He stretched the lead to two. And then, as you say, disaster struck on the on the ninth hole. He went out of bounds. It was just, uh, just out of bounds, just left of the cart path. He went on to make a triple bogey seven. Um, and unlike Johnson, he actually marked it down as a seven instead of a six. Um, he would recover with a string of pars thereafter. It seemed like all of those around him were dropping shots. Jordan Spieth had an incredible chance to win, just couldn't hold any butts down the stretch. Tyrrell Hatton, uh, one of my tips, 35 to 1. He had every chance as well. You know, he was in the lead at one point, um, just couldn't quite get it done. Rory McIlroy, another one of my tips, was right in the mix. He had a putt in the last hole, about 10 feet, just went past the hole. Uh, Scotty Scheffler was right in the mix as well. You know, huge big name players right in the mix but it was um kit yama he'd never won before and he landed the hammer blow on the on the tricky par 317th one of the shots of the season so far under the pressure put it to up 12 feet uh, rolled it in moved to nine under um he missed the fairway down the last he just needed a par uh, and he, he was in some in some deep rough great iron shot into the heart of the green uh to about 40 feet just needed two putts for the win nearly nearly canned it 
finished just just shy, uh, but tapped it home for a one-shot win over McElroy and, and Harris English. And um, as I say, yeah, it's now his first win on the PJ Tour. Wins a, as you say, 3.6 million, that'll do. Being, a, being an elevated event, uh, this is what happens now, you know, if you win, you win big. Um, he becomes the first player to win on debut um, since 1990. I think Robert Gammer's won there. Wow. Famously hold out his second shot uh, from the 18th fairway. Um, Kitty Armour, he'd, he'd already become the quickest of two wins on the DP World Tour, but they were pretty low-key events in Mauritius and, and Oman. So this is his first big win. Um, as I say, as you win, you win big. He's 45th to 19th in the world now. And, and that just gives him so many playing privileges now. That's, you know, locked his card up for the next few years. Um, so happy days for Kitty Armour. And, you know, I think a lot of people going into that last round thought he would be swamped, uh, especially after making triple bogey on nine. You know, to come back, that shows uh, a lot of mental strength. So so fair play to him. Um and just a quick word on, on John Rahm, you know, obviously he was the, the short price tournament favourite going into the week. I think everyone thought he was going to run away with it after day one, shot 65, went two shots clear. We thought, here we go again. Um, but the wheels really came off for him. It was quite, quite in, incredible. Um, he ended the week down in 39th. He had 76, 76 on Thursday, uh, Friday and Saturday. I sent him tumbling about, I think that's his worst result since the Scottish Open in July, which is testament to how well he's played. Yeah. Um, he still remains world number one, but the gap has just been trimmed slightly now with obviously Scotty Scheffler and, and McElroy playing well again last week. So um, we could see another turn at the Players' Championship this week uh, in terms of the world number one position. Um, but yeah, Ram narrowly remains ahead. How quick the tables can turn, can't they? Well, we'll come on to uh, the tips for the Players' Championship yeah. in a minute. Cool. Um, but there was also some fairly big news about over the weekend too on Tiger Woods mm -hmm. uh, in that Jack Nicklaus has revealed Tiger intends to compete on the PGA Champions Tour mm -hmm. when he's finished on the PGA Tour. <laughs> is that a bit of a shock? It is actually, yeah. It's took me by surprise a bit. I, I've, I've always assumed Tiger was just going to hang up his spikes immediately sort of after calling time on his, his PGA Tour career, which which let's face it could be anytime soon given his, his fitness concerns. But look, I think this is great news. I think if he if he does fancy a knock on the over fifty circuit when he when he gets the opportunity in was it three three years time, I think he's forty seven now, uh, he'll get to use a golf cart over there as well, which um, you know, it sounds like when he's playing in practice and, and he's using a golf cart, he's he's regularly shooting sixty fives and sixty fours out there, so he says. Um so I could see Tiger contending on the PJ Champions Tour, I've just never really thought he would want to do that. Though I, I've always just assumed he, you know, he's he's got a he wants more majors, he wants more PGA Tour wins, um, and I just feel like once he got to fifty, maybe he would just call time on his career and and just kind of go around and watch his son Charlie play golf. But um, yeah, apparently he's told Jack Nicholas that he would um, certainly be considering PJ Tour Champions career. Um, especially as he could use a golf cart, I think that's going to help him. On it, on you know, he won't have to walk seventy-two holes, um, so that'll be easy on his on his um, his back and his his, his legs. Um, so yeah, great sign. I think that the Tiger's even looking that far ahead. I think we should probably look at it that way. I think you know he's not kind of thinking, "Oh, am I going to have to retire next week?" It's mm. looking forward. So um, I wouldn't imagine Tiger would play a, a full schedule on the, the PJ Tour Champions. Maybe he'll just play the senior majors and, and things like that. You know, Mickelson was kind of doing that just before he went to, to live golf. Um, so yeah, great, great news for, for Tiger fans. And, and just on Tiger, he's, he's decided not to, to play in the Players' Championship this week. Um, obviously, he looks to continue his rehab and just get himself into full fitness for, or as good as fitness, you know, for, for the Masters in what is three weeks' time now. Because I think, you know, we all want to see him, see him, Fairly fresh for, for that one. We do indeed. Well, mm. come on then. Let's, let's go to the tips. <laughs> so uh, Tiger's out of it. But yeah. what are your tips for the Players' Championship then this weekend? Okay. Well, I'm, I th you know what? I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna play without repeating myself. But <laughs> the way he played last week, McElroy, to win his second Players' Championship, uh, I just like what I saw, especially on the weekend uh, at Bay Hill. Say so one here in 2019. Uh, he looked really good at the weekend. Very, un very unlucky not to win. Um, trending nicely. As I say, he's just going to really want to start ramping things up ahead of the Masters, which I already think he's going to win. So he will be my main wow. pick. I think he's 10 to 1 as well, which I think looks looks fair value. Uh, you know, Ram did not play well last week. So um, 
you know, how Ram Muller Ram bounces back this week remains to be seen. Um, but but McIlwain and Scheffler certainly look the two guys at the, at the top of their game going into it this week. But I'm going to take McIlwain as the main pick. Um, I'm going to go Patrick Cantley again, 18 to 1 this week, I think represents uh, great value. Uh, he's third at the Genesis, fourth on Sunday. Uh, just left his run too late. Seems to be the way with Cantley at the minute. He's just leaving that run too late. He's playing really well weekends, but just can't quite get off to a, a fast start and that's sort of holding him back. Mm. Um, doesn't have the best record at Sawgrass, which would be a little concern, but I just think the way he's playing, uh, 18 to 1, I like the look of that. So it'd be my second pick. And at slightly bigger odds, uh, Jason Day, 50 to 1. I think that represents really good each way. Uh, value fifth, ninth, tenth the last three weeks. Uh, looks to be on something of a mini resurgence. The back appears to be holding up nicely. He won this event in in 2016, and um, yeah, I would just love to see him get back into that winner's circle because uh, he's such a good player on his day. So uh, McElroy, Cantley, and Jason Day, please. All right, then. Well, those are Andy's tips. Let us know uh, if you're thinking on the same lines or you're going <laughs> for something completely different. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below or get in touch with us at Golf Magic on all the social medias. Um, but that that brings us to an end. Uh, short and sweet for this week. No guests, sadly. Uh, everyone's busy. But we'll be back <laughs> with more guests uh, in the next couple of weeks. So uh, thank you for your continued support. Uh, do make sure you stay tuned in across golfmagic.com for all the latest news and analysis across the week. And then we'll be back with you same time next week thank you andy um get your questions in if you've got any or we just love to hear your thoughts as i say in the comments section below and we'll see you next week but that has been from the tips the golf magic podcast bye-bye